Life Church. I uh, hope you guys have had a great week. Um, uh, it, was, uh, it was neat to cheer on our, our Aggies. We love you guys. You guys are awesome. We're so, so thankful uh, for you. Uh, but uh, hopefully you guys have enjoyed uh, not quite so hot a week. Um, it, is, it has been blistering. I've, uh, I don't, I'm praying for fall, quick, um, and, uh, as maybe many of us are. But uh, hopefully you guys have been enjoying the summer. As the closer we get to September, it seems like that normal rhythm begins to kind of settle in. Um, and we find those school rhythms, work rhythms, life rhythms, um, and, uh, and so hopefully you guys have found some of those things. If you were with us last week, we launched a brand new series uh, called Brainstorming, and obviously the whole emphasis of this Brainstorm uh, series is all about this topic that has been avoided, I think, by the church for far too long, and not just avoided, but, but uh, inappropriately handled, um, and, and it's this area of mental health. Mental health has been a kind of a taboo, a misunderstood, uh, a mishandled sort of topic in the area uh, of the church for far too long. And, and we just kind of addressed and stepped into saying, look, this is a real struggle. Just like there are real struggles we have in our spiritual life, um, we have real mental struggles at the same time. You know why? Because we, we are part of the fall. We are part of a broken world, a broken society, and it all stems from sin. It all stems from our first parents. And so that brokenness, that decay that's been introduced into our world affects every part of our lives. And we have to begin to come alongside and say, look, does God just want my soul or does he want me? Does he want just, does he just want me to, to see him in eternity and like just get used to how garbage life feels? Or, or can we Understand that there is a God that is interested in you as a whole, the holistic you, from mind, body, soul, spirit. He wants all of you, the entirety of you, to understand that there is freedom and that there is life and there is hope beyond the struggles that our world inevitably kind of engages us with. And so I wanted to start out this morning, before we dive into anything, I want to just start in a moment of prayer. You guys have had long weeks, we've had long weeks. Um, there's been a number of things going on, as already mentioned by Pastor Dennis, from the Maui fires to uh, the school sh- the, the shootings in Florida and otherwise. And, uh, and I just want to just pay attention to what's going on right now in your lives and in this world. And I want to ask God to just step in. I just want him to just, I want to invite him into this moment. So can we just start out this morning uh, in prayer? So Father, we, um, we're not enough. We're not smart enough, we're not talented enough, we're not capable enough. You created a creation that was meant to be 100% dependent on you. And God, we don't always do that. We don't always lean into you, we don't always trust you, we don't always uh, walk that path, that journey. We, we choose our own way, we choose our own path, and, and we know inevitably how that oftentimes ends. So right now, God, I just pray right now, whoever's online or here present and all the challenges and all the burdens and all the things that they feel like they have to hold in the palms of their hands, Lord Jesus, I pray right now that they would just flip their hands over and lay it down. God, that we would just lay it down. We would lay our families at your feet. We would lay our marriages at your feet. We would lay our children and our children's schools and everything that they're engaging in life and the challenges and the temptations that they're confronting, we lay it at your feet. God, we take all of our cares, we take our work, and we take our extended family, we take, Lord Jesus, our finances, we take our relationships and our friendships, and we lay it at your feet. Because it's only there. It's only there. Can we really find healing? It's only there. Can we really actually step away and unburden ourselves and actually cast our cares on the Lord because you tell us that you care for us? And so I'm going to believe that this morning. And maybe for those that are here, God, I pray that they would believe that for the first time. You care for us. God, thank you. 
thanks that we get to serve and know and live life with a God that is so interested in our hearts, our souls, our minds, our well-being, more than even we are. So God, thank you for who you are. Jesus, thank you for ushering us into an undeserved place and privileged relationship that only comes from you. So Holy Spirit, would you settle in? Would you fall fresh on our lives? And that you would open up our wounded hearts to hear exactly what you want us to hear this morning, that we can walk away different. Jesus, we we pray for what's happening in Maui. We pray for what's happening in Florida and the rest of our nation in our government. And we just lean into you right now. We thank you so much that you're in control of all things, sovereign over all. We believe that and we declare that in Jesus' precious holy name. Amen. So our goal last week was to step in and help us understand the reality that mental health is a real struggle. It's a real thing. Our goal this morning, um, as I shared last week, is I want to talk a little bit more practical. I want to talk a little bit more pragmatic Um, for students and those that are here. Look, we're, we're confronted with a hard life. I don't even know what you're walking through, but I can tell you right now on some level or many levels or on every level, it's hard. There's nothing usually easy. Nothing is uh, a cakewalk, as some may say. There's there's nothing easy about life. And and so I I believe that in this week, I just want to talk a little bit practical, like how do we just manage life? How does God want us to navigate life? the things that we're bombarded with every day. Because if, if we're honest, nothing about life will stop until we do. Until, until we find, we, we offer our last breath, there's really not that, that break or that reprieve a lot of the time. And yet God calls us into this world, right? He calls us into this space and this place and he and He. He's challenging us to live well. To, he goes, I, I want to I wanna give you an abundant life. And so what are some of those things, some of those ways, those means by which God himself has laid out before us for us to handle this overwhelming area of, of mental health and just life in general? You don't have to look too hard to understand that we need some healthy rhythms in our life to handle the world that's around us. And as I mentioned in the beginning, God is interested in all of you. He's not interested in just some of you. He's not interested in just one part of you. And sometimes we think that. Sometimes we, we kind, of, uh, kind of section off our lives and God, 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 okay, God's got this, but I got this. God's going to handle this because this is a biggie in my life, but, God, but God's not necessarily worried about this. And, and I think that misunderstanding causes us to not necessarily reject God, but forget God of how to invite him into these moments that we need him, which is every part of our life. There should be no part of your life that is is removed from God's hands being present. God wants to be engaged in every part of your life so that you can understand that that he loves your mind, your body, your spirit, your soul, your strength, everything about you. He wants to step in and begin to navigate. Life happens. If you pick up the Bible today, there's a number of characters that you would read about in the Bible. And I just listed just just a couple. Like this is a small, small list of a, a, a much bigger list that we could probably look at as you navigate through the Bible. There are people that just deal with life. And I think it's important for us to understand that, that your life is not unique in this sense. It's not unique in the sense that, that busyness isn't, you know, it was never part until now, you know what I'm saying, and, or tragedy or different things like that. And so I just wanted to put in front of you, just for the sake of you understanding you're not alone as you walk through these challenges, as you understand that there are pressures of life that face you every day that affect up here, that affect our mental health, our mental well-being in so many different ways. And so, so just, just for the sake of having a list, we've got Gideon. 
In Judges chapter 6, he was busy. It says that he was threshing the wheat by the wine press. And then, so, so Gideon had a busy life. He was busy. And then obviously, we, if you know the story of Gideon, he, he was engaged. God called him out and, and he was engaged in a, just a battle of 300 men. And he, over, and he overcame massive odds. Life hits. Saul. Saul was busy searching for his father's lost beasts in 1 Samuel. I mean, he, yes, he was a king. Can't imagine the CEO stress that comes with all of, all of those responsibilities. And so Saul definitely had that busyness. Naomi, the mother-in-law of Ruth, she loses her husband. She loses her sons. What a tragic moment. Like there's... Make no mistake, life is hitting as you read through the Bible. Life happens. Like there are challenges, even unexpected so, that continue to happen. And you can read about that even in the book of Ruth. And then, then you come across people like David. And David, man, he just walked through sin. For Samuel, we, we, we hear about the, the deceit, and we hear about the lying, and we hear about the adultery, and we hear about Nathan finally confronting him and kind of saying, look, you're blowing it, man. You're missing it. And David went to a very dark place. Life hits. And sometimes it hits hard. King Hezekiah was under attack of the Assyrian army. And, and like the, the Assyrians were trying to convince all the Israelites, just give up, throw your hands up. There's no way you can find victory. There's a lot of pressure. There's no way you can overcome this obstacle, this enemy that's in front of you. That's a heavy weight. Life happens. Nehemiah, he was busy burying the king's um, uh, wine cup. He was the cupbearer for the king. And then God placed this huge burden on him, to th this calling to go and rebuild the wall and reestablish the nation and the temple in so many ways. And life happens. And then finally, obviously, you have Moses. Moses was a, this busy Busy boy, man. He grew up in Pharaoh's kingdom, and then obviously a number of circumstances led him back out into the wilderness, and, and so on and so forth, and, and he was busy tending flocks, and, and he had his hands full, and Exodus chapter 3, life is just busy. Life is hard. Life is faced with a number of challenges that every single one of us here, if I had the time, you could probably give me a laundry list of the challenges that you are currently facing. Every single one here could probably qualify that list, and some could, could probably even have a longer list, depending on how long you've lived and depending on the, the kind of challenges that you have faced. But, but life hits hard. And like I said, that it's never going to change until eternity. So, because we live in this broken, fallen world, we continue to force ourselves to respond in ways that we were never originally designed to respond. Do you understand? God designed us as a creation to worship, to be a creation that worships him. But then when sin came in, it tainted those things. It tainted everything we are part of and that curse that fell on the land and all of us, it, it, it ushered us into this place of bearing burdens we weren't originally designed to handle. And yet, and yet God, God created you in such a way, in such this beautiful, intricate, hands-on sort of way in order to help you, in order to help me, in order to help us navigate these burdens that we find in life. Life is full of pain. Life is full of hardships. C.S. Lewis said it best. He said, I'm not arguing that life's pain is not painful. Pain and life hurt. Like, he's not pulling any punches. He's like, this is, it, it just hurts. That is what the word means, pain. But if I knew any way of escape, I would crawl through the sewers to find it. <laughs> he's like, look, I get it. I want the outlet. I want to find a way to ha handle this. But life is hard. Pain's a part of it. So how do we, as as emotional, mental, physical, spiritual beings navigate this, I think God gives us a few helpful means of helping us to understand and how to navigate 
this area of mental health. Stress of living life. Stress of living life. John 16, tells us this. He says, here on earth, you will have many trials and sorrows. Okay? So, so the goal, remember we talked about last week, the goal. The goal is to not be trialless. The goal is to not get to this place of comfort where I don't have any responsibilities where I can wander around like a nomad, not having to answer to anyone, say anything to anyone, like all, all of those things. That's not the goal. The goal is peace. The goal is peace. Peace in your heart, peace in your mind, peace in your soul. A steadfastness, an ongoing level of, of absolute, just, just between me and God, there's, there's not this massive gap, but there is a rhythm of life, a peaceful rhythm of life that God can usher his creation into despite the brokenness in our life, despite how much we have fallen from grace. And so this thing called stress comes up. In this life, you will have trials and sorrows. Get used to it. It's part of it. Get the t-shirt, okay? All right? Get a t-shirt that says, man, there's going to be trials. There's going to be sorrows. It's a promise. It's an actual promise. It's not, it's a statement that God goes, you're going to face trials and sorrows. And our body, our body is impacted by these trials and sorrows. And it's something that we've identified as stress. So what's the definition of stress? Let me just give you a brief definition. Stress can be defined as a state of mental tension caused by a difficult situation. Sounds like everyday life, right? <laughs> sounds like trying to get the kids to school. It sounds like trying to make it to work on time. So it's, it sounds like trying to pay the bills at the end of the month. It just sounds like life. It can be defined as a state of mental tension caused by a difficult situation. Stress is a natural human response that prompts us to address challenges and threats in our lives. This is just life. It's just life. It's part of life. Remember, it, it, it's, it's not that you're broken or you're so... It's just that you're human. And human life experiences stress. This is... It, it, you, you can't run away from it. It's just part of our life. And as I mentioned last week, I gave you this pathway. So if you're stressed, you have thoughts about things. You gather everything together and you have a thought and how you think is going to affect how you feel. How you feel will impact and even help inform how you act. And then that's where we discover our rhythms of life, how you interact, how you respond to the world around you. And how you act can come out either healthy or unhealthy, right? Like it, it, there's going to be times where, man, it's just, it, it, it's a healthy way of responding. It's a healthy way of coming out. But then there's unhealthy actions. There's unhealthy responses that we have, ways of dealing with life and with stress, so I love being a dad. I love, I, I love being a dad. I, I still love being a dad in every way. But I remember when Michelle and I were, were carrying our first. I loved being a dad, but I did not love the preparation involved of being a dad, okay? Like that was very overwhelming for me. Uh, the, just all these thoughts and all of these things that, that had to be done and the responsibilities and, and oh my goodness, it doesn't just involve me and Michelle and it, it's now this responsibility of this other life. And, and then it's, it's almost like this surreal moment when you bring this other life home with you and this new life is in your house and you are responsible for the well-being of this child it it was overwhelming and i'm i'm reading books and i'm and i'm i'm realizing that I, some books i just want to be like oh my is this true and then i realize 
Okay, that author didn't know what he was talking about. You know, <laughs> like it's just completely furthest thing from the truth. Because every child is unique and every, every parenting journey is, is unique to a lot of the time the parent-child relationship. And, and it just seems like that they didn't know what they were talking about. And then I realized I didn't know what I was talking about. And, and so I'm overwhelmed. I'm overwhelmed. I had a go bag like the day we did the test. I'm like, all right, I got a go bag. Let's go. You know, so like when we're going to the hospital, I've got the go bag. We're going and Michelle's like, whoa, whoa, bring it down a notch there, tiger. Okay. All right. It's going to be fine. Okay. She is soothing me. She is calming me, uh, which really wasn't the, the, the best way to go about handling that. But it was stressful, but yet it was joyful. It was this, this weird dichotomy, this, this, okay, I'm sure this would be the happiest moment, and yet this is the most stressful moment, and I'm pulling my hair out at different times, and because the truth is, is everything, there's a lot of things in life that contribute to stress, right? There's a lot of things in life that contribute to stress. I just, I, I laid down a couple different things. There's, there's, uh, there's routines. Your routines can cause stress. You'll, you'll have difficult situations that come up that will cause stress. Relationships. Friendships, right? Those are all and can contribute to stress in your life. They are extrinsic things that come in from the outside that create a difficult situation in your mind, your heart, in your body in some way. Relationships, work relationships, marriage relationships, children, parent-children relationships, sibling relationships. Also responsibilities, work, home, finances, all these things we've already listed Random, expected, and unexpected experiences. No one, I mean, this past couple weeks, we've had some expected people that, that were going to pass away. And we're brokenhearted for them. But then we also had unexpected losses. There's some families that walked through unexpected like I didn't see this coming. I didn't know where this came from. And yet it comes. And yet it happens. And, and you're trying to, trying to deal you're trying to navigate those situations. Like, what do I do in these unexpected moments, these unexpected deadlines, these unexpected health concerns and struggles? Sometimes stress is just because of self-inflicted appointments, right? Like, we just take on stuff. We, we acknowledge that there's stuff out there, and sometimes we'll just go, yeah, I'll do that, yeah, I'll do that. And your, your wife, your children, everything about you is like, Why? <laughs> Why are you doing this? Do you hate me so much? Like referring to yourself, like do you hate your body so much that you're going to say yes to one more thing? Like what, what are you doing? And sometimes stress can contribute to that. And then finally, like I said last week, mental health and the struggles that we have isn't always caused by sin. But it can be. It can be caused by sin. It can be caused by those deep, dark secrets, those, those areas that we have yet to surrender, those areas that we feel compelled and always drawn back to, that, that we think that that sin holds a greater promise than that which God has for us. And so we run back to it and we wonder why we can't function well here or here. And we keep going back to these rhythms thinking that they offer us something, but yet every time we go back, it seems to steal a little bit more of us. And so I'm not saying it's the only thing, but definitely sin can usher you into that place of where you're struggling with mental health in a very hard and a difficult way. But despite all of these contributors, like I said in the beginning, God designed human bodies with precision, and detail and intentionality that allows us to work through. And this is what's fascinating about our God. He goes, I love you so much. I've given you a, a means by which you can take even practical steps to find healthy rhythms in your life that, that when life happens, how, what do I do? How do I navigate these moments? Because that's what we're asking. How do I navigate life then? Because if inevitably comes, Joel, you just said, trials and stars, what do I do? How do I engage with the world around me? So, again, let me remind you, I'm not a scientist here. I am not a mental health expert. I am not a professional in that area. I am a pastor. But I love being informed about a number of different things. 
And so for the sake of putting it in front of you, I want you to understand how stress hits you, hits me every day of our life, and how God's given gift that we call a human body and our mind and our response system deals with some of this stress that comes out, okay? So I'm just going to go down this, this path that when you get hit with stress, what happens to you? So the very first thing is obviously there is external stress. There is something that happens. There is an event. There's an unexpected event. There's relationships. There's all these different things. And so there is a psychological stressor or there is a physical stressor that is introduced into our lives. This, in, this is introduced from, uh, from a number of different places, but there could be some sort of mental stressor that comes in or some physical stressor that comes in, and now we've got to deal with it. Well, as soon as it gets from these stressors, mental and physical, we then have our next area, this next category, our stress response. Now, here's what's fascinating about the human body, okay? When these stresses come in, your, your mind, your body categorizes it. He says, it says, okay, is this a new stress or is this a recognized stress? And so it goes into this, to this area, this, this hypothalamus type area where it's new, or it goes into this recognized uh, the sympathetic, sympathetic, something like that, okay, I'm butchering it, uh, sort of area where it is a recognized area. And so your body kind of already knows how it's going to respond. So it's this recognized and then unrecognized, this new and this recognized sort of area. And then after it ca- quickly categorizes either a new stressor or something that is recognized, it then goes into this area of mediators and receptors. And I'm not, there's a lot more details and I wasn't going to go into to like the, the nitty gritty of all this, but I want to give you one mediator from that area. As soon as they're classified, all of a sudden, the CRF, which is called uh, the corticotropin release factor, this is what releases chemicals into your body, okay? So when stress happens, it's either new or it's recognized, your body releases chemicals into you in order to handle the things that are coming into your life. And these chemicals that are released into you are, are, are meant to help you adjust, adapt, help you to navigate the current situation that you're in, even to endure hard things. And these chemicals, not, this isn't all of them, these are some of them, consist of cortisol, adrenaline, noradrenaline, okay? Now, Cortisol, th- these three areas, and neuro- noradrenaline is kind of a neurotransmitter, these three things are also known as kind of that fight or flight response. So our body is, is taking in the stress of whatever's going on. And if it's recognized, then it kind of knows how it's going to function and what, how much chemicals to release and how much uh, kind of the pathway it's supposed to go. If it's new, it's kind of figuring that out and trying to determine how much, how much chemical to release in these areas. And, and it's determining how much, how much like anxiety and how much panic uh, that your body is going to, how much tension needs to be found in order for you to kind of stay the course in order for you to handle this new burden that's come into your life. This fight or flight response that you have is a God-made thing. So let me say that. Everything that we've talked about, this is God's way for the human body to respond to the stresses in life. Then from there, as these chemicals are released, there are body responses. There are uh, side effects, if I should say. Okay, side effects in some regard when these chemicals are released. From your body, just your body, you get some of these. You get uh, your energy management, how that is actually uh, is affected. Your sleep, your digestion is affected. Your immune response is uh, uh, kind of impacted. Your metabolism, like how quickly you process nutrients and all of that. Your reproduction, organ function, all of these things are impacted in some way. Sometimes in order to draw energy from one place in order for you to expend energy in another. 
So the body knows exactly how it's, it's responding to this current situation. Again, this is a natural response that God has designed the human body to engage in. But it's not just a body response. Sometimes there's a mental. Actually, every time there's a mental response. What are some of these mental effects that happen when these, these chemicals are dumped into your body? Let's look at some of these mental effects. And I'm not going to go into... I gave you three. There's more. Cellular excitability, neuroplasticity, and synaptic plasticity. Okay? Here's what you need to understand about that. Your brain is, is, in, a, is in a mode where it is structurally remodeling the neural pathways in your mind. Okay? So it's, it's going, okay, I got a stress. I've got this burden. Okay, Chemical release, is it recognized, is it unrecognized? My body, I got, an, I got an upset stomach because of what's going on. And now your brain is going, what kind of neural pathways do I have to create in order to handle the given situation? This is, all, again, all the natural response that God has designed. Now, if that's all that we knew, then then uh, th that would be kind of a bad ending point. But I want you to understand what this whole effect is. If you continue in a short sort of manner, if, you're, if there's a short term, your body is fighting to become homeostasis, another word for what it would call normal. It's trying to balance everything. So it's releasing things. And so in a short term sort of way, it's, it's trying to find something called allostasis. It's trying to re-kind re of balance everything in its own way. And it has a natural way of helping to do that. This allostasis is this short-term, like, okay, hey, man, I, I, a stressful situation happens. I'm trying to get normal. I get normal. Yay. All of a sudden, levels are back to normal. Everything kind of comes down. We're able to kind of begin to navigate in a better way, and everything is fine. Here's where it becomes difficult when it goes longer than it should. When, it go, when you're in that fight or flight sort of situation, your body is constantly releasing these chemicals. It is a failure to adapt. You enter into this allostatic load. This is where, this, look, this is healthy response. This is where we're like, okay, we got stress. How do we deal with it? This becomes unhealthy. This becomes toxic for our system. This is where those neural pathways are no longer just temporary pathways and structural remodeling. They become a little bit more permanent. And so those things that you didn't see happen or you didn't see coming, all of a sudden you begin to respond over and over and over in the same way. And you begin to see these patterns and these habits come out and your body is constantly on edge and it's constantly responding, responding to the environment around you and you just become overwhelmed. It becomes overwhelming. God wants you to find a healthy place. Proverbs 14, 12 says this. There is a path, and you've heard me read this before. There is a path before each person that seems right. You think you're handling stress well. You take it on, you're like, I know how to handle this. But then all of a sudden you read the Bible and you're like, I don't know how to handle this. <laughs> right? There's a path that seems right, but it ends in death. And if we know anything about stress, the longer you're under that and the longer that you experience, it affects everything about your life. It brings you to a place, health-wise, mental-wise, everything-wise, and you begin to decay and you begin to fall apart. And, and that allostatic load, mean, it, you hit that breaking point of, I just can't handle it. I'm overwhelmed. That's where that place gets. And, it's, and what it is, it's a cry of your body going, Hey, warning sign, how you're dealing right now is not the way you ought to deal with it. Is there a healthy way of living that allows us to begin to live towards that final peace, that final goal that we call peace? I love what Isaiah 26.3 says. This is the NIV. It said, 
you will keep in perfect peace those whose minds are steadfast because they trust in you. They trust in you. And I love that because you will keep in perfect peace those whose minds are steadfast. And that steadfast mind comes because I'm actually trusting, not handling. See, there's just this, it's this shift So how do I trust in God? How do I believe that God's way is better than mine? He gives us some great tools of helping us understand this. Ephesians chapter 5, I want you to look at this. He goes, let me give you you a game plan. Ready? Imitate God. You want to know how to handle stress? Imitate God. Therefore, in everything that you do, how you you go about and you function, and, and how do you imitate God? You need to know God. And you need to understand who Jesus was and how did he live. You, get, you find that by, you, by diving in the word of God, which is why we constantly send you there. How did Jesus live? How did he think? How did he function? How did the disciples who follow God, how did they live? How did they function? Paul said it best. He said, follow me as I follow Christ. Imitate God, therefore, in everything you do because you are his dear children. Live a life filled with love, following the example of Christ. He loved us and he offered himself as a sacrifice for us, a pleasing aroma to God. It goes on to say this. For once, in verse 8, you're full of darkness. But now you have light from the Lord. Once we handled stress and life a particular way, but when we come into Christ, there's a new path, a new pattern, a new habit, a new way of thinking and living. And it's for your benefit. So live as people of light. For this light within you produces only what is good and right and true. God has a way of finding healthy spiritual homeostasis, physical homeostasis. This, there is a normal rhythm that God says, you're going to function best in this by doing it this way. Then it goes on to say, verse 15, so be careful how you live. Isn't that true? Don't live like fools but live like those who are wise. Meaning, I don't have all the answers. I just know the one who does. So I'm gonna run to him. So uh, make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. Don't act thoughtlessly. I like that. Don't act thoughtlessly. Really pay attention. Pay attention. We've gotta pay attention more than ever. Not just for ourselves, but for our children and our children's children. We've got to pay attention to the world around us. Don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. So what does he want us to do? Let me just give you a a couple things, four things that God says I want you to do, things that you need to pay attention to. Again, just practical things. Four practical things. The first is rest. The first, God's godly practices that encourage good mental health, rest. God wants you to rest. Sometimes we live in a world, especially in the United States, where we think rest is a bad thing. Hello, hello. It's a great thing. (laughs) It's a wonderful thing. I mean, when you understand Sabbath, you're you're going, God, bring the Sabbath more, okay? I know you worked, you know, you worked for six days and then you rested on the seventh. Maybe it could be five and two. I don't know. I'm a four and three. Let's, Let's figure this thing out because rest is a beautiful thing. Exodus 34, 21 says, six days you shall work. But on the seventh, you shall rest in plowing time and in harvest, in harvest, which means this, God commands rest in the busiest times of your life. You're like, how can I, how can I do that? You, you have to. Do you understand? This is not, God is commanding you to. In the busiest time of your life, make margin in your life to rest. And then he says, In harvest time, meaning in the most abundant times, when everything's just coming at you, rest. Rest. This is a spiritual discipline. This is a spiritual command that God calls his people into rest. And when we do that, the physiological effects that it has on your life, some of you have read some of these articles before about sleep and stimulus. It helps with memory. It helps with focus. It helps with problem solving. It helps with awareness. It helps with logic. It helps with you uh, being able to, uh, to create new memories. It helps you um, to, to be able to just have a mental ba- balance. When you find rest, your body is affected in so many beautiful ways. 
When we give God this opportunity and go, I'm going to do it your way. See, now this is, a, this, is, this is us having to lay down our pride. But Joel, you don't know what I have. You're right, I don't. But God does. And he's telling you, I know what you have. So what part about my command didn't you hear? <laughs> Rest. Take a pause. This is beneficial for your life and your mental health and the way that we handle stress. Psalm 23, verses 1 and 2, you know this. It says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And I love how he says this, he makes me lie down in green pastures. You know what that tells me? God's going, oh, you're not going to do it? Okay, I'm going to make, make it very easy for you to do by bringing you to a breaking point where you have to rest. Do you understand? That's why your body gets to these breaking points. Because he's going, you need to sleep. You need to just take a break from, from work. You need to just step away and rest, and rest in the Lord. He leads me beside still waters, that peace. Second thing, organization and planning. Organization and planning. I love what General, General MacArthur, Douglas MacArthur said. He was the supreme commander of the Allied uh, during World War II. He said, organizing is what you do before you do something. So that when you do it, it gives us that much more time to offer another round of bullets to our enemies. <laughs> Good job, General, right? Organizing. There's something beautiful. There, there, it, there is, it's a spiritual discipline to, to lay out things in an orderly fashion. God is not an author of chaos. He is an author of order. And, and he wants you to step into that because what that does is that creates margin in your life, healthy rhythms in your life. As a matter of fact, there are studies that say that those that implement organization in their life, it actually lowers your cortisol levels. That fight or flight, it actually brings it down and affects you in some beautiful and incredible ways. Look, organization um, and planning... Um, hitting, look, when I hit a wall, sometimes there's that challenge of, I got to get over it. I got to climb over that wall. How about sometimes understanding that sometimes, sometimes God is putting a wall in front of you, not to climb over it, but to rest inside of it. You ever thought about that? Like there's an organization, there's a, there's a healthy, there's healthy boundaries that we have to have in our life. And an organization helps us maybe sometimes discover those. I get some of you are like, man, I'm gonna conquer this mountain. I'm gonna con and yes, those are great moments, but also know you, the limitations in your life are set there for a reason. God wants you to live in a healthy, healthy way. Stephen Covey, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, said this, make time for planning. Wars are won in the general's tents. Wars are won in the general sense. Plan it out. Take the moment to live out your life in such a way. I'm not going to read this passage, and I'm, uh, so you guys don't have to put it up, but in Exodus, Moses is having a conversation with his father-in-law, Jethro, and Jethro's like, you got to delegate some of this stuff. you got to organize your life where you kind of plan your life out so that you're not killing yourself. He's saying this in Exodus chapter 18. He's very clear about this. He's saying, don't kill yourself. And here's how you can help do that. Organize yourself. Lay out the leadership that you need around you in order to accomplish everything that you need to get done. It's an incredible principle that we need to all apply. Third, diet. Diet, okay? Oh, you're like, oh, of course, Joel. Got to go there. And again, I'm speaking to me, all right? Let's just, let me say it this way. Everything in moderation. Everything in moderation. Is, there, is, is food in and of itself sinful? No. Food is not sinful. God made that very clear in the New Testament multiple times with Peter and others. Food is not sinful. It's our abuse of food that takes it further than what it was meant to be in our lives. We take more than we should. We take too little of what we should. It becomes an area of control in our life. Everything in moderation. We've all heard the term that you are what you eat. John Hopkins did an article, did, they did a study on this. This is fascinating to me. 
He says, they, they discovered that your brain and gut are highly connected. Because see, everyone thinks that, that when my brain's not working, I'm going to fall into depression or anxiety or these different things like that. But did you know that your stomach has a brain? And I didn't even know this. And they call it the ENS, and the enteric nervous system. That when you are not eating well, your stomach has the power to affect your mood. Your mood. That hangry mood, right? You get, there's a reason. It can affect how you think, how you function, how you feel in so many different ways. So wouldn't it be important to take, take in the, the things that God has called you to take in? 30 to 40 percent um, with weight and gut and digestion issues experience stress and some form of mental health issues. 30 to 40 percent. You are what you eat. It's a godly principle. It is a practical principle to say, hey, eat right, eat healthy. Lay out how God wants you to live in in an incredible way because God wants you to live healthy. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20 says this. Don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? Like you house, you house the presence of God as the Spirit lives within you, who lives in you and was given to you by God. You do not belong to yourself. This temple, if you, if you understand, you steward it. You don't own it. It doesn't belong to you. It belongs to the creator who made you. And he's saying, take care of it. Live well. For God brought you with, God bought you with a high price, so you must honor God with your body. It matters. It matters what you put in. It matters what you feed it. It matters what you give it. Fourth thing, final thing says, learning to say no. Learning to say no. This was a hard one for me. <laughs> learning to say no. This was a very hard one for me because I like saying yes. And, and Michelle knows that. My wife knows this. She's like, why do you say yes to her? I don't know. I don't know. Got to say no sometimes. Learning to say no. Once again, Stephen Covey, incredible. He, said, he made this statement. He says, you have to decide what your highest priorities are and have the courage, pleasantly smiling, non-apologetically, to say no to other things. And the way to do that is by having a bigger yes burning inside. Like there are yeses that God wants you to go, yeah, that is a yes for you. But all these other things that you've already said yes should have been no's. You have a 100% ban within your life. Do you realize that? And many of you are trying to go for 110% and 120%. You've got 100% bandwidth. And just make no mistake, when you're saying yes to one more thing, you better be saying a no to it as well. Something else. Something else has to be, it's got to be a no. You've got to fight for margin in your life. And this isn't just for me. This is from so many other people that I respect. Andy Stanley, Craig Rochelle, Bill Bright, Howard Hendricks. So many different people have made that, that same statement. For every new yes you, you say in your, mix, in your maxed out life, you simultaneously better be saying a new no to something you're currently doing. Because God wants you to say yes to the right things, but not at the cost of you losing your life in the process, losing your mental well-being, your health, fighting for margin. Do you realize that no one here is a superman or a superwoman? There's a reason why they only exist in the comics. Do you get that? Okay. There's a reason. Because it's not real. No one can handle it. No one's capable of doing it. So... Let me give you one line, final verse and we're done. Romans five, uh, 8, 5, and 6 says this. Those who are dominated by the sinful nature think, I love that, think about sinful things. Like you, we, we put this all in our mind. We think about sinful things. But those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit think about things that please the Spirit. So letting your sinful nature control your mind leads to death. But letting the Spirit control your mind leads to life. And then our ultimate goal, peace. Do you, do you realize that 
as you read that final verse that we're looking at this morning, God is saying, surrender to the healthy patterns, principles, and habits you have in your life by allowing the Holy Spirit to flood you, fill you, and lead you so that those neural pathways that are set bring you to life rather than death. Like God is trying to create rhythms and disciplines in your life so that when stress comes, because it will come every day, even this morning, you're stressed just by listening to me. I am so sorry about that. But the reality is, is God's going, hey, I want you to create these pathways that are healthy and beautiful. And it's, it's when we surrender to the fullness of how God has established our lives, the rhythms of our lives to be, do we create those healthy pathways in our life. And I know this is a really practical one to kind of talk about, but I want you to understand how important it is. I, God wants you healthy all the way of, across your life, not just your soul. He wants every part of your life healthy and whole, and he's created a path and a plan by which you can do that. He's created a remarkable body, but make no mistake, you push that body to its limits, it's going to break. It's going to break. That's why God goes, hey, look at my way. Look at how the Holy Spirit's flowing in and through your life. And, and the second part is, is there's two, two times, if, put, if we could put that verse back up real quick. It says the word letting. It says the word letting. If we can put the verse back up real quick. I'm sorry, I know I jumped, out, jumped around on you. It says letting your sinful nature. You're like, you're letting it. You're giving it permission in your life. But when you have Christ in you, Greater is he that is in us than he that is in this world. You no longer have to let your sinful nature win. You no longer let your sinful nature and these outside stressors dominate your life. You can now let the Spirit of God control your mind and bring you to peace. This was God's plan. This was God's design. This is what he means as you step forward in healthy life, healthy living, not just now but for all eternity. Let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Some of you need to lay some things down. Some of you have patterns in your life that have created neural pathways in your life, that have created rhythms in your life, that have maxed you out, that have brought you to this allostatic load where you're just dying and you can't live. And God goes, I want you to find allostasis. I want you to find this healthy rhythm of where you are finding normal so quick. You're getting back to that place of where I can use you. God wants to use you. He has got a big yes in your life. And because we're listening to the sinful nature and the things of this world, sometimes... We overwhelm our lives and we end up trying to heal rather than trying to help God in building his kingdom. And I'm not saying that there's not moments where we've got to heal, because we do. There's moments that I've had to heal. Goodness, there's daily moments that I have to heal, it seems like. But right now, I feel like God is calling us to live differently, to think differently to let the Holy Spirit do what the Holy Spirit does, to bring us down healthy pathways and patterns that can change the way that we react to the world around us so that we can live new, fresh. So right now, I just want to offer a prayer over every single one here that God would begin to lay down paths and patterns in our life so that we can walk different now and forevermore. So Father, I pray right now for every person here or online, God, I pray that you bring us into a rhythm of life that fully is surrendered to you, surrendered to your plan, to the way that you want us to live. God, that we would find rest, that we would find organization, we would find a good diet, we'd find the means and the strength to say no to the things you want us to say no to, yes to the things you want us to say yes to, that we would find healthy margin in our life, that we would begin to live out our life the way you always designed for us to. In this life, we will have sorrows, we will have trials, and we will have tribulation. God, you tell us that. But then you also tell us at the end of that verse, but take heart, I've overcome the world. I've created a way when there was no way. And it's all about laying it down and trusting everything at the feet of Jesus and believing that you, your way of living life is better than my way that I choose to live it sometimes. 
So God, we repent of these moments. I pray that if there's someone here that doesn't know you as Lord and Savior, I pray that this morning that they would come to know you, that they would give their heart to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, that they wouldn't walk out of these doors without having done that. Lord Jesus, thank you for what you and you alone have done. Thank you that you're such a good God, such a great God. You have such a plan for healthiness and wholeness in our life. Would you do that now and forevermore? In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen. Love you guys.